Hey everyone, welcome to the Zest, the official podcast for Orange Coast Magazine. I'm Chelsea Ranieri, and you know today's guest as the voice of Megara from Hercules, as well as the original Belle from Broadway's Beauty and the Beast. She is also the executive producer of Disney Princess the Concert, which you can see in Anaheim, March 22nd and 23rd. Thank you so much for being here today, Susan Egan. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. I am. Um, so in addition to the roles I mentioned, I personally recognize you from 13 Going On 30 and Gotta Kick It Up. Two great, like 13 Going On 30 is like one of my all-time favorite movies. So I've been really excited to get to talk with you. Oh my goodness. That's so funny. That's a blast from the past. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so um, you grew up in Seal Beach. What was um, What were you like as a kid? I did. What was I like as a kid? Not into, I wasn't doing theater when I was really little. Um, really? Loved the beach, uh, played tennis. Um, I, I used to figure skate down in Costa Mesa. Uh, no when way. I was down there. Yeah. And that's actually what got me into dancing to support oh. that figure skating. And ultimately when I stopped skating, my schedule like kind of cleared up. I didn't know what to do with myself. And my friend's like, you should try out for the musical. <laughs> so I did children's theater um, oh. at a company called La Salle Players in Los Alamitos, which is where I went to school. Uh -huh. And um, and yeah, it sort of took off from there. And I read that Los Salle Players was kind of the beginning of how OSHA started. Is that right? That's exactly right. So it was some no local idea. teachers, theater teachers, um, Terry Bigelow, Ralph Opasic. Um, they taught at Pine Middle School, which is now McCullough's. <laughs> McCullough. oh, no way. And, and they had this summer children's theater. Well, then when I um, went from, you know, eighth grade to ninth grade at La Salle High School, uh, Ralph Opasic became the, the choir teacher there and, um, and started this program. And really, I just, you know, I, I was a dancer. Um, <laughs> best friend, Julie Seaborn was the star of the school and she wanted to take voice lessons. And so she and my mom talked and her mom drove one way and my mom drove the other oh, way. And wow. it was a Orange County story, right? Carpooling. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's how this career started was carpooling. Yeah. <laughs> so the voice lessons, was that for singing? It was, it was for singing. I had and had you sang before? before? Oh, wow. No, no, I just danced. I was a ballet girl. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> But I wanted to do the musicals. And so I would get into the ensemble because I could dance. And then um, Julie just needed a carpool partner. So I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, I'll take voice lessons. And, and it kind of clicked. Wow. Yeah. Take me back to one of your earliest memories of performing. So probably doing Annie with Lost Out Players. And then wow. going into high school, we did Guys and Dolls. And just really what what it feels to me was like finding a family, finding like a, a smaller group within a big school that, um, you know, you're thrown together the fates of casting and then, <laughs> and then you're pretending together. Right. And we had a great, a great director at La Salle high school, um, Judy Trujillo, who just oh, created the most incredible and magical atmosphere. She was incredibly supportive. And it was this gathering place of people from all walks. There were like, there were jocks from the water polo team. <laughs> there were, you know, the nerds over here. There was, I was totally on the nerd side. Um, <laughs> We all came together with this common interest and just the magic of, of putting a show together was pretty incredible. And like I say, I got in because I could dance. And then by my sophomore year, junior year, I was started getting roles. And then my senior year, I got to be Mary Poppins. <laughs> oh, wow. That was so exciting. I'm sure it was a very illegal production. I'm, I'm sure nobody was paying royalties to Disney. So you know, now that I work for the mouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. So after um, you graduated Los Alamitos High School, you went to, um, you, oh, sorry, after you graduated, you went to UCLA. And then after That's you graduated right. UCLA, you were recommended for a role in Bye Bye Birdie, which eventually led to your role as Belle. Can you kind of research? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> gosh, I think the summer between my sophomore and junior year of college, I went and did, um, I got my equity card, my union, theater union oh. card, doing summer stock at the St. Louis Muni, which is like 35,000 seats. You can't even imagine. You're on stage <sighs> and you're looking at the very back row and their heads are this big. And then it occurred to me, oh, my head is this big to them. Like, okay, maybe I won't wear false eyelashes. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I did two shows that summer. One of them was Bye Bye Birdie and one of them was No No Nanette. And what was interesting was uh, Tommy Toon, who is just a very famous Broadway director, star. Oh. He's got nine Tony Awards. Maybe he has more by now. Um, he was doing... Bye Bye Birdie and Summerstock. And I remember thinking, 
this man has all these Tony awards and he's doing summer stock. Like maybe this isn't a great career, <laughs> but maybe I should go back and major in something else. <laughs> um, but actually what he was doing was he was trying Bye Bye Birdie on. Bye Bye Birdie was originally a Dick Van Dyke show on Broadway, Dick Van Dyke and Cheetah Rivera. So Tommy came in in the Dick Van Dyke um, character and they changed the show a little bit to fit him. And, you know, it was a great fit. Oh, wow. I didn't know any of this. I was just a 20 year old. Um, <laughs> but the next year in my dorm room, I got a call from Tommy Toon saying, Sue, Sue, he's Texan. Sue, oh. Sue, so I really love doing Bye Bye Birdie. And I think we want to take it on a national tour. And I'm calling a few people from the Summer Stock production to see if you want to come and do it. I'm like, what? Oh, That's my crazy. God. So what I thought was a two week job ended up being a year and a half job in Whoa. a by Birdie with Tommy Toon, who really became my mentor. You know, he is kind and creative and supportive and just was such an incredible role model. And he was the one, you know, I'm I'm a California girl like yeah. you. So <laughs> I just thought after this tour, I'd go back to Los Angeles, try my luck as an actress. But at that time, Los Angeles really was not a theater town. Really? And Tommy's like, Sue, Sue, they're never going to know what to do with you. You need to go to New York. They're going to know what to do with you. And so so I did. I moved to New York and in the first six months, ended up getting Beauty and the Beast. Oh my God. I, Oh, all of that to Tommy. And he came and saw every, every Broadway show oh. I've done. Like he has continued to be just, you know, he's a beautiful soul and, um, just celebrated his 85th birthday. <laughs> oh, amazing. He sounds yeah. incredible. So uh, Beauty and the Beast went on for a 13 year run and you were yes. nominated for a Tony award and a drama desk award. Um, what yes, are some I of did your not do all 13 years. <laughs> oh, you didn't. Okay. How many no, years did you do? I just did the first year on Broadway and then okay. we took I don't know, seven or eight of the original cast um, to open the show in Los Angeles. And I did it for another year in Los Angeles. So I did six months, you know, before Broadway, a year on Broadway, a year in Los Angeles. Wow. So I did it for two and a half years. That's incredible. Um, what are some of your favorite memories of being Belle? Oh my goodness. I think it's so, you know, nobody's ever actually worded the question that way. And this is 30 <laughs> years later. My favorite first memory, and it's going to make me teary, was oh. going to Anne Hold Ward. She was the costume designer. Going to her workshop with Barbara Stamanek, who was this amazing seamstress, and um, and trying on those dresses for the first time. And just putting yeah. on this golden yellow dress, which weighed more than I did. And, oh, wow. And just having, looking at the detail that Anne had put on the gown just for me that an audience isn't even going to see or like the embroidery she did on the inside of the blue dress because she just felt like, Oh, maybe Belle's mother did that for Belle. Like oh, things wow. that just would inform the character that was just, it, it's a craft, a true craft. These were not clothes. These were works of art that actually ended up that yellow dress ended up in the Smithsonian for, for quite a while. Oh um, my God. The, these gowns were unbelievably beautiful. And I think the first time I tried them on, like that was when reality set in and I was already like four weeks in rehearsal. <laughs> like, oh, wow. we're really doing this. That sounds like such an amazing experience. I can't even imagine how beautiful those were in person. Oh, uh, so how did you first hear about the role for of Meg from Hercules? For Hercules? Oh my goodness. Okay, great question. So um, I always wanted to be on Broadway. Mm -hmm. I had my Broadway role. It was really thrilling. And then you realize it's gone to the ethers at 1030. <laughs> the show's done. You know, at the time in the early nineties, nobody was illegally filming it and like loading it up on the internet because right. there was no interweb yet. <laughs> in so, um, <laughs> it was amazing to be, to do a show in real time and to have everybody there and to hear the reaction. But now I'm working for Disney and I realize you know, the art form that is timeless, instantly mm -hmm. timeless are the animated features because they will outlast me. You know, I was 23, 24, I guess, by the time I auditioned for, wow. for Meg, long ways away from getting married and having children. But I even knew then, like, this is something my children will see. This will be something that their children will see. So I really wanted to, so I had this new dream of doing an animated feature. The problem was the character description of Meg was Jaded, sarcastic, <laughs> string of bad boyfriends, sells her soul <laughs> to the devil, like all of these things that are not Belle. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and I guess I was so convincing as Belle, which is because anybody who knows me knows. Um, um, so that they would not let me audition. 
Oh, what? I was already working for that team. I was working for Alan Menken. I was working for Michael Cosrin, who's the music director of, of Beauty and the Beast, who was doing the movie. And they're just like, no, 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 Susan's not right. And it was the first time I was really a squeaky wheel. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> but they finally let me audition. And I don't think what they realized was that Meg was described. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm choking. Oh, no, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> I'll start that sentence again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Meg was described as Barbara Stanwyck in The Lady Eve. Now, if you don't know what that means, okay. Barbara Stanwyck was an actress in the 30s and 40s. And the script of Hercules was written in the style of these mobster movies and these screwball comedies of the 30s and 40s. And oh, there was this sing songy cadence to the way those actresses spoke. You think of Lauren Bacall, and she says, if you need me, just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you? You pucker up your lips and below. Now, here's the story that I don't get to tell a lot. My dresser in Beauty and the Beast uh -huh. was a huge fan of these old movies. And she would bring a dip. This is how long ago it was. She would bring a different VHS tape to me <laughs> every single night to the theater. And she would say, okay, Susan, tonight you're going to see this, you know, Joan Crawford movie. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about it. Like it was an education women's roles in, in film history. She yeah. was so knowledgeable and so I would go home at night to my like apartment in, you know, Harlem and, <laughs> and sort of wired from having done the show. And so then I would have this two and a half hour movie to watch. And I would watch Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and Barbara Stanwyck and Lauren Bacall and all of these absolutely incredible actresses, you know, Judy Garland. And so I was educated in these movies. And so when I went and they finally let me audition for Hercules, the, for, the scene that I read for them, they all put their heads down on the table and they're looking at a picture of the character. It's really weird because usually people look at you when you audition, but yeah. not, for, not for voiceover. They want to look at the character and listen to the voice to see if it makes sense coming out of the face that they're looking at. So anyway, so all, it's all the same people that I see every day and their heads are down. And it's the scene where Hercules meets Meg and he says, you know, are you all right, Miss? Uh, uh, and she says, Megara, my friends call me Meg. At least they would if I had any friends. So they give you a name along with all those rippling pectorals. And all of their heads pop up one by one. And they're like, Susan? Because <laughs> the tone of Bell speaks up here and everything. Papa, you know, and, and they're like, Susan, I go, I've been trying to tell you when I'm Bell, I'm acting. Meg, <laughs> that, that's who I really am. And, <laughs> and they finally caught on. Now, the process for an animated feature, there are no callbacks. The tape oh. that they, they record you and that tape, that cassette tape, because this is 1993. <laughs> That tape, maybe even 92 at the time, um, gets called back. And a year later, I'm in Los Angeles in the hallway of the Schubert Theater doing Beauty and the Beast. And Michael Eisner, the CEO of Disney at the time, is walking down the hall. And he's like, hey, Egan, great audition for Hercules. And I'm like, oh, that was like nine months ago. Whoa. I get to Eisner. <laughs> but what happens is they take their three favorites and they test animate to it. And because sometimes their favorite voice doesn't work with that character for whatever reason. And ultimately about a month later, I learned that I got the role and wow. we started recording while I was doing um, Beauty and the Beast at night and we were recording Hercules during the day. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> amazing. So it took yeah, almost but, a year from the time you would audition to the time you started. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. I would say like a good eight, nine months. Yeah. Wow. Did, were you like, and then you record anxious? and then it's like 18 months until the movie's released. Cause it takes oh. that you record first and then they animate to your voice. So the process of animation takes a year or two years. Um, and so I was recording in 94 to 95 and it came out in 97. Wow. How was yeah. the, um, how was voice acting different from what you were doing on stage? Great question you realize right away, you don't have your body language, you don't have oh. your facial expressions, and you need to infuse those lines with the frustration or the love or the exhaustion or the whatever it is. It has to sound like the emotion because you don't have your, your face, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sitting there recording and I'm like, you know, 
The people in the back row at the Schubert Theater also don't have my face. So it it actually adjusted how I perform on stage. I've learned to really infuse a lot more into just the sound of my voice. Um, oh. And so it ended up influencing how I was doing Beauty and the Beast. You know, things influence each other. Um, it's fun to do voiceover though because if it's a close-up scene, if it's an intimate scene, you don't have to project to that back row like you do in theater. So it's it's a fun sort of exchange of things. A lot of things are similar. A lot of things are different. It's it's just a different platform. It's fun to, you know, it's a good exercise for an actor. Definitely. And then um, fast forwarding a bit, you were in, um, you played Lynn for Spirited Away in 2001. That movie yeah. scared me so much as a child, but I love it as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it is scary. <laughs> You know, the Miyazaki movies aren't really designed for children. Oh, per yeah, se. That makes sense. He just writes great stories. <laughs> yes. And he didn't have the budget to make live action movies with special effects. So he told these stories through animation. Now children oh. love them, but really adults love them. Like these yes. are adult stories. When they, I hadn't seen Spirited Away when they offered it to me. And so I'm like, well, what's the movie about? And they told me, you know, it's about this 10 year old girl who ends up working in a bathhouse. And I'm like, who's calling social services? Like, this is not okay. <laughs> and then I saw it in Japanese. I'm like, and it was my first Miyazaki movie I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that these Miyazaki movies, when, when he was making movies, these movies influenced Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the head of animation at Disney into oh, wow. resurrecting the animation department at Disney. So it was Miyazaki who influenced him to go, maybe we should make a movie called The Little Mermaid. And that, of course, changed everything for Disney. Whoa. So, it, you know, these things inform each other. And it wasn't until, you know, 10 years later when they, you know, convinced Miyazaki, like, no, 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 you can trust us with your, with your movies and, you know, allow us to dub them into English so that an American audience um, can enjoy them as well. Because mm -hmm. I think people now are not afraid of subtitles because we're all yeah. closed captioning our, movie, our movies. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> but, um, but at the time, you know, really Americans didn't know Miyazaki. And isn't it thrilling that, you know, that movie Spirited Away won the Academy Award? Oh, wow. And, it's incredible. you know, and now he's just, you know, the, his latest, my, it's so interesting because of all the things that I've done, it, the Miyazaki movies are the things that my daughters are the most um, interested in. Wow. Um, you know, we just saw his latest movie, you know, the boy and the heron. It was beautiful. Oh, I'll have to see that one. Um, how was the voice that you did for Lynn different for what you did for Meg? It wasn't at all. And that's really? what was frustrating. So I, I went, I'm like, well, what do you guys want? They're like, well, oh, actually here's what happened. So in addition to translating the movie into English, they were also translating the culture. Mm. In Japanese culture, your elders are very respected and your elders are very strict. So Lynn, as this sort of older girl advising Sen, was maybe a little harsher than an American audience would accept. So they were thinking, how can we translate this? We thought, well, what if we make her just more streetwise? What if we oh. make her just a little more sarcastic? Why don't we bring like a little bit of humor to her? And somebody said, why don't you get that girl who played Meg? <laughs> and so I went into the studio. I got, so I got the job and I went into the studio and I was so excited to come up with this new voice. <laughs> and like, no, like, exactly like Meg. So she sounds exactly like Meg. So I was like, oh wow, there's an actress with range. <laughs> but then I got to do another Miyazaki movie called um, Porco Rosso. And mm -hmm. That one, I got to have a totally different kind of voice. And so that was that was really fun. Oh, how fun. I'm going to have to go back and watch Spirited Away and listen for Meg. Oh, my gosh. I get it actually all the time. Because, really? Because you know, people stream these movies now, right? These movies are so accessible. And so they're like, oh, when I heard Lynn, I knew immediately it was the girl who played Meg. <laughs> Sometimes vice oh, cool. versa. Yeah. And I... I can't let you go without talking about 13 going on 30. I love this movie. And I'm pretty sure it's like, I remember I was so happy in the movie when she gets like nice friends. It was you and the receptionist, but yes. I'm pretty sure doesn't she cheat on your okay. character's husband? Cause you're Tracy, right? You have, you have dived deep. I'm really <laughs> impressed. Okay. Here's a story with 13 going on 30. First of all, um, you know, film and TV pays for my theater habit. So I don't, <laughs> I don't love doing film and television, but I do it because I got to pay my rent. Yeah. Um, so 13 going on 30 was a real blessing. It got me health insurance that year and I was nice. grateful to do it. Uh, an interesting thing. So the woman who plays the receptionist, she's actually the casting director of the movie. What? And she oftentimes in movies that she casts, she does such a good job reading against actors that the directors are often like, hey, 
you should be in my movie. And so she ends up doing, so I, every once in a while, I see her, I'm like, oh, she got a cameo in that movie. <laughs> oh, she's in that movie. Anyway, she does a, such a great job. How so cool. she was like, she was the woman who cast me. Um, and I had a whole storyline that got cut out. So yes. So Jenna, sweet Jennifer Garner's character yeah. was not a nice person, right? Originally. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was indeed having an affair with my husband. Yeah. And so we filmed all of that. Um, and we had such a great time. The cast was so, I'm still super close with all, we call it the poise posse. Um, all of the people who worked the magazine were still in touch with each other. Oh my God, how cool. Years later. Um, and Mark Ruffalo was great. Anyway, the director called me while he was editing and he's like, Susan, I just want to call you personally and tell you, I'm really sorry, but we're cutting the whole storyline. Oh. I go, no big deal. I got my health insurance. <laughs> what happened was when we t told that storyline, when Jenna's character discovers what she'd been doing to you, your character, who is so kind and loyal to her, it makes her unforgivable. It makes her unlikable oh. to the degree that it, the story doesn't work. I'm like, ah, cut it. Who cares? It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I'm barely in the movie now, but it still get the same residuals. So it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. I like, I just picked that up the last few times I've been watching. It. I was like, wait, that's that girl. Like he, she's cheating. Yeah. yeah. It's a fun um, guess. Bob, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so Disney princess, the concert, tell me a little bit about this. It was originally called Broadway princess party. So how did that right. start? So my dear friend, Benjamin Rauhala and Laura Osnes, they're geniuses. They, Ben was on a Disney cruise ship with his friend, Jeremy Jordan, who's a big Disney Broadway name as well. He's so talented. They were doing concerts on the Disney cruise ship and they decided on a lark to go to like the princess tea party, which obviously they're not the demographic. <laughs> no, it's got nothing to do. And, um, and they're sitting at this table drinking tea, maybe. And they're like, huh, there's Cinderella. I know Broadway Cinderella. Huh, there's Belle. I know Broadway's Belle. Huh, Jasmine. I know Broadway's Jasmine. <sighs> and Ben goes home and he is uh, a program director for 54 Below, a really famous club that does cabaret acts in New York. Oh, cool. And he had this idea. He's like, you know what could be really fun is on a Monday night off when Broadway is dark, what if I pull all my princess pals together and we just sing the entire canon of princess <gasps> music? Like this was going to be a one-off. So he's got Christy Altamar, who's Anastasia. He's got Laura Osnes, who's Cinderella. He's got Courtney Reed, who's Jasmine. He's got, you know, Nala's. He's got everybody. He's got, you know, future, um, future Anna's and Elsa's and all these, these ladies together. And the thing sold out immediately. <sighs> and we're all sort of trying to figure out why. And it's, and it's basically because all the millennials mm -hmm. who watched these movies on repeat in the 90s are now 28 to 35 with expendable income. And they never stopped loving Ariel. Mm -hmm. They never outgrew it. There's just no content for them. So 54 Below booked it a couple more times, whatever. Ben and Laura get a call to take it to Orange County. So I'm not a part of it when it's, when it's in New York because okay. I'm raising children in Orange County. <laughs> um, and, um, but they're coming to Seagristrum. And so Ben calls me and he's like, Suze, you know, they can't bring 15 ladies. So they bring Courtney and Laura. They're like, Suze, would you join? And we'll just do it as a trio show. I'm like, sure, why not? I'm not doing anything, you know, rehearse me while the kids are in school and I'll, <laughs> I'll come to this on a weekend. I love, I love the Orange County Performing Arts Center. So Seagristrum now. Yeah. Um, and so we did the show and I just looked at it and I go, I think there's more here than, than you guys are really realizing. I think this could be bigger. And so Laura, Ben and I sat down and we just sort of thought about it. And what I, what I said to them is yes, it's Broadway fans. Sure. Because these are Broadway actresses, mm -hmm. but my other half of my career is in animation and you guys have never been to a Comic-Con. You've never seen 10,000 people dressed up as their favorite character. You have never seen the bell dresses that I have seen, which rival my Broadway costume. Whoa. There's also such a feeling at a Comic-Con where two bells meet in the center of this, you know, this place. And they're not like, my bell's better than your bell. They're like, oh my gosh, did you make your shoes? And who did your wig? And like, like there's such a love fest, which is what our show was too. Because we are usually the only girl in the show, right? Courtney's the only girl in Aladdin, you know, Laura's the only girl in Cinderella. I'm the only girl in Beauty and the Beast. And so to get to sing together, to be three women on stage together, 
looking at our diverse, looking at how different we are, but also looking at us supporting one another. Mm -hmm. um, it just felt great as an actress. <laughs> it was fun to sing with these powerhouse voices because I'm usually just singing by myself. Um, and I thought, you guys, we could step this up. This isn't just a Broadway thing. This is a pop culture thing. And I think we should develop this to be have a broader base. Yeah. So we formed a company and we did that. We toured it for two years and we had a really good time, but we all made a lot more money in our solo careers. So we thought, <laughs> okay, I think we're done. And then Laura and I got approached by different symphonies simultaneously saying, could you do Broadway Princess Party with a symphony? Now we can play clubs all day long because it's just been at a piano. But once you have symphony charts, you have to pay royalties and you have to pay sync rights and all these things. And, so, and I do a lot of symphony concerts. So I called the Disney library, but I warned my partners. I go, it's going to be a no. <laughs> and it might be a cease and desist. <laughs> we were like, it's okay, let's call because we're kind of done with it anyway. So I called Disney and I'm like, hey, so I usually rent two charts from you, but I need to rent 26 charts from you. And they're like above my pay grade. So it escalates <laughs> up to the president. And ultimately I have a conversation and I send them our YouTube clips, which now have, you know, 400 million people. Oh my that. God. We've had such a grassroots following. <sighs> and so they see what we are and they see that we are embracing the brand. We don't make fun of these characters. We love these characters, but we are tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. And maybe even most importantly, we work for families, but we are speaking to millennials and they, unbeknownst to us, we're about to rebrand their princess franchise. <gasps> The Princess franchise is the third most powerful at Disney behind Marvel and Star Wars. Wow. Um, so they're very careful with it, but they were about to rebrand it from the big pink bubble letters to this black and gold logo that's really streamlined because they realize those 35-year-olds still love Princess and there's no merch for them. Disney. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they were about to have a global campaign called the Ultimate Princess Celebration that was across every faction of Disney worldwide. And they didn't have a live concert to go with it. Oh, my and God. And I called them the week they'd had the meeting that said, but we have nothing live to perform. And they looked at these YouTube videos. They're like, um, it's not just a yes. It's a you need to be asking for more than the charts. And I'm like, should I be asking for the animation? They're like, yes, you should. Whoa. I go, should I be asking for your marketing department? They're like, you absolutely should. <laughs> so, <laughs> we formed a partnership with Disney Concerts and we signed the contract, Chelsea, on March 4th of 2020. Oh, to no. To shows in June of 2020. Oh, no. <laughs> but oh, man. because of the pandemic, Instead of rushing through a process, mm. we had a whole year where we were on Zoom every day and we redeveloped the show in its entirety. And wow. because we could do that, we wrote brand new orchestrations. I got to record it with a, a symphony in Nashville. Oh. Very COVID. We did one section at a time, everybody in masks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we got to really do it right. And so that was ended up being a, a blessing, honestly. Yeah. And then we started touring in 2021. We, um, to 22, we played a hundred U S cities. We took a year off of the U S and in 23, we played 16 countries on five continents. Wow. And now two nights ago, we just launched our new U S yeah. tour. We're playing another 40 cities here. I'm only doing the first week on the U S tour, but I've got an amazing cast when I, when I leave, yeah. um, I have amazing cast now with the other ladies I'm singing with. Um, but the two of us that are, are two of us from this cast are going to head over because we have two shows simultaneously now for the first time. So we're going to have a cast here doing the U S tour. And then we've got a cast in Korea and Japan. So I'm heading over to Asia. To do, oh my gosh. To do yeah. How exciting. Wow. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This is amazing. Um, oh, well, gosh. in addition Thanks to everything, that I, of course, in addition to everything I mentioned, um, which is you have so many incredible accomplishments. You also have over 40 recording credits, seven solo, solo albums. You've performed at Carnegie Hall. You've given master classes at universities, including Kelsey Fullerton. Um, is there anything else that you want to call out for listeners to keep an eye out for? 
Oh my goodness. It's, it's fun to put things like that. Like, yeah, I've been Carnegie Hall. I've been the Hollywood Bowl four times. I've been, da, 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 da. but really that's just a really nice way of saying like, wow, you've been around a long time. You know, <laughs> I'm representing my fifties, you know, I'm, I'm working with these 30 year olds. <laughs> also that was 20 year old. That and was like, so yeah, Meg. That was yeah. like perfectly and Meg. Like, yeah, I have my credits, but that's just because I got 30 years on them. <laughs> but no, I think what I'm loving is, um, how Disney has, has, I didn't know it when mm. I got cast in Beauty and the Beast, that Disney would be a family um, for all time and how supportive they would be that they have allowed me to work literally as an actress for every single faction of the company from, yeah. you know, got to kick it up at Disney yeah. channel to, um, to records and albums with their label to, um, you know, to uh, uh, the stage and, and animation and the fact that when I called them, you know, I knew them at the, at the library at Disney music, cause I rent charts from them all the time. And the fact that they were willing to, um, to let me be a producer for them, to let me work behind the scenes for them and to like women and have done for me in the past. Um, I've worked with great women at Disney. Linda Wolverton wrote Beauty and the Beast. Um, Alice Dewey was the producer of Hercules. Uh, and, and these women were such examples and role models for me. And now Disney's given me an opportunity and a platform to get to hire women yeah. <laughs> um, and, and to work with them and to build something that can sustain them in between their Broadway shows and, and to bring this music globally, uh, you know, not even just in the United States. I think um, I'm, I, I, my gratitude is I, I can't articulate it, I, mm -hmm. but I'm so grateful. And the fact that, you know, coming from Orange County at Disneyland's back door, like Disney's always been part of our lives. Right. Yeah. Uh, I just never anticipated that, that, um, that not only would they be part of my lives, but they would give me opportunities to grow as a woman and explore things and produce and do, uh, you know, great stuff. And, and so I am excited to continue doing that. I've got four other titles with the company now that I'm producing. Wow. We've got, I produced and wrote a show at the Hollywood bowl last year with my partners at Disney and my partner, Adam Levy, also from orange County. Um, wow. And we're writing a new show for the bowl this year. Um, and, you know, I just, I couldn't be more proud with, with what we're putting out there. And, you know, um, we have traveled the Middle East, we've traveled Asia, wow. we've traveled Australia and the audience reaction is the same everywhere. And it's such a testament to the idea that, um, to the truth that Disney music and these characters and their courage and kindness really brings people together at a mm -hmm. time when, not everything is bringing us together. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I love that. Well, before I let you go, I have three final questions for you. We call them the thoughtful three. Okay. Um, so first, what would you tell your younger self knowing what you know now? Oh my gosh. Um, to relax. <laughs> Kindness is more important than accomplishments. Mm. Um, you put your head on your pillow every night and living with integrity. Not that I did it, but I mean, but I think I was so ambitious and I was so working like, Oh, I need to get that next line on my resume. And I think I mm. could have just relaxed a little bit and looked up from the day to day grind and, and soak it in a little bit more. I did have great mentors in Beauty and the Beast who, who held my hand through it and really said, you know, this is your first Broadway show. This is not what it's always like. Like, and so I really felt with Beauty and the Beast, I did appreciate everything because mm. I had that, Fowler and Gary Beach teaching me these things, but I would, but that's something I would say to my younger self. I love that. Um, and what advice would you have, um, for aspiring Broadway performers? Oh, you know, YouTube is a blessing and a curse. Oh. Um, when I'm behind the table, auditioning people or reading with people or working with people, um, I want them to know that their uniqueness is their superpower. Mm -hmm. We had original cast recordings. Like I might listen to Bernadette Peters or, or, you know, somebody on a cast recording and try and mimic that when I'm auditioning for that show. But now there's videotapes of Kristen Chenoweth. Now, Kristen's a friend of mine. What makes Kristen magical? Yes, she can hit any note in the stratosphere, mm -hmm. but what makes her magical is that that is authentically who she is. I mean, I've been yeah. in yoga booty ballet classes and she's like, Susan, why are we here? Like <laughs> that is, she's not acting. Like that is who she is. And that's why it is oh, breathtaking to watch mm -hmm. her. I don't want you to pretend to be Kristen. I want 
your Glinda to be you. I want you to, I don't want you to be Ariana Grande's version of it because Ari's going to be great in it, but, but it's going to be her version of it. So I really want people to like, look at the source material once and then just look at the script, look at the music and ask yourself questions. What would I do in this position? Because then your performance is really going to be authentic. Wow. That's really good advice. Um, and then lastly, what skills did you develop from the challenges that you had to overcome? Oh my goodness. Um, even in the last four years, right? We have all learned to pivot. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pandemic was, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it did two things. It immediately gave us perspective on what is actually important mm-hmm. priorities and what we could just let go of. I now have almost no hills I'm going to die on. I'm not going to argue a lot of things <laughs> because they're not that important. And the blessing of that is when I do make an argument for something, the people understand like, oh, I'm going to listen because she really doesn't argue points a whole, like she's like, you know, I would do it this way, but yeah, I'll do it this way. If that's how, what you want is how I'm working as in a collaborative art form. But every once in a while, I'm like, guys, this is the hill. This is the hill. And here's why. And so when you pick those, you know, I think the pandemic helped with that, mm-hmm. um, of like recognizing what's important and what you can just let it oh, go in the words of Elsa. And, um, yeah. And then pivoting, you know, producing theater, we have obstacles every single day. And if you internalize it and get upset about it, honestly, it's just going to slow down the process. But if you can laugh at it and go, all right, that's what we're working with today. Yeah, right. (laughs) That's my guy for this. Let's figure this out. You know, we were opening two nights ago and Ariel Jacobs was flying in and we got word that her flight was rerouted to Charlotte because somebody on the plane, unfortunately, was sick. And we didn't know if she was going to make opening night. And we all just looked at her and were like, well, it's a show with three-part harmonies. And now it's just Cindy and me. Like, what are we going to do? Now, Ari ended up getting here, but nobody freaked out. We just go, okay, like this is where creativity is important. So yeah, pivoting. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. This was so much fun. And I love learning all the little tidbits about all these different movies that I had no idea. Thank you. I'm so glad. And thank you for having me. And I encourage everybody to go, go to the shows in Anaheim. This is, this has ended up being like a great first theater experience for young ones. It's great for families of every generation because everybody identifies with a different princess. Is it the Moana modern or is it the millennial Ariel or is it the OGs, Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty? Uh And um, it's become a big date night. We've had a ton of people propose marriage at our concert. Who knew? Because it's so romantic. Yeah. Um, and we, um, you know, it's 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 great for those theater kids. They come in full regalia. And that's what I encourage. I've had dads dressed up as Elsa with signs that say, oh. that it, like, just embrace. Like, whether you're Disney bounding or you're coming full on with a fishtail. Like, just <laughs> come and have a great time and be sure and sing along. We are having a party. Well, thank you so much again for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Have a good one. 